All right. So before we get into that, though, we need to have a little bit of a review. And so we haven't really talked about our delta functions in a while, but a delta function right starts at zero ends at zero area of one and the non zero time is much, much less than any All right. Now, mathematically, though, right, the height is infinity and the T non zero equals one divided by infinity. All right. Now, If we recall, uh, con using convolution with delta functions, right, is really easy because convolving anything with a delta function is the thing itself. All right, and then, um, and so if we have delays, whoops, you know, T minus one, we get the same function, just delayed by whatever, All right? And if we have, um, Two, two. Okay. And then the other interesting thing, right, is that is that convolution is multiplication in the frequency domain. Okay. Now this is uh, going to come in uh, handy for convolution. I, I mean, for modulation, because what we do is we multiply things by um, a carrier frequency, which is really just a cosine, all right? Um, but since we're here, right, if I have H of T Now we can do this in the frequency domain. Um, and convert back. But really what we have. Is a high pass filter. 
All right, when you have that delta function and then you're subtracting something or, all right, I have this, you know, I have a shape going up and then I have a shape, a non-zero shape in the opposite direction. And of course I could have this too, right? That's uh, the high pass. And if I took that, right, H of S, oops. Okay. I would get that. But what's um, really interesting is that in this example, right, I would convolve UT and delta, which then would give me the UT, right? And then I would convolve this step function with this decaying exponential, right? And ultimately you would get right, which is, oh, and I forgot the UT, which is that high pass shape, all right? So if, um, where'd it go? You're looking at the final exam practice, right? You're convolving something with a delta function and something opposite. So that's going to be high pass. It can't be notch or band because there's only one decaying exponential. All right. And there's no, not critically damped would have a T in here. And then uh, under damped would have um, a cosine or a sine, All right? And if it were under damped, I mean over damped, there'd be two decaying exponentials. All right, so it can only be high or low. And the fact that you have a delta function minus something makes it a high pass. And here we just have some shape that starts and ends at zero has a non-zero time, it's got to be low pass, okay? Any question? So, um, these are the questions off of the practice exam, um, which is open, but it's, it's not really any kind of graded assignment, all right? Um, you can just go into my open math and um, you can see the questions. Now, there might be a place to draw certain things, but um, really the exam is, it's gonna be of this kind of format, okay? And there's even an essay question. Some questions, yeah, you can enter in values, but some, uh, like if there's a DF2 somewhere. Right, it, it's not gonna evaluate whatever you draw in there. Okay, it'll be more like midterm two. Um, so anyway, the final exam is on the 10th. It's in the green sheet. Okay, you guys can look that up. Um, no, I'm not going to ask you to find R and C values. That's something like more you would do in lab. Okay. So So 
So cosine omega t times cosine omega t is convolution in the S domain. So this works both ways. So if you're multiplying here and it's really a multiply, you have convolution there. Is it um, some of these questions are right in right in the thing? I'm I'm not I don't have time to answer them. All right. Um, but as far as the exam is concerned, it'll be like midterm two. And I'm only even if a question has a space for you to enter in an answer, I will only be looking at the PDF. Um, office hours will remain the same. Um, for the time being, okay? These notes are, um, have been maybe slightly updated and they're in, they're in Canvas. So let's talk a little bit about modulation. All right. So the thing about uh, modulation is that if it didn't exist, we, w we couldn't possibly communicate, right? So if you have a signal channel, right, which is, could be a physical medium, right? So let's say um, we're in a crowded room. We're all using the same air to communicate, right? We're sending vibrations along the same air. So if we've got 100 people in the room all having a loud conversation, our um, all the sine waves of our speech, right? If you take our speech and break it into... For your expansions, right? We're going to be constructing and destructing, interfering with everything, and it could be very hard to hear each other. So the only way, without the ability to modulate, right, in order to talk, right, we'd have to rely on the fact that our voice only carries so far. So we would have to separate. So let, let's say six feet, for instance. So if we were six feet, so if two people were close together, but then the, you know, couples are separated by six or 12 or 24, right? You wouldn't hear the other conversations, not due to modulation. It's just that those, um, everybody else's conversations have just been attenuated because it's far away. All right. So. Um, without modulation, if I had a wire or a fiber optic cable, right, only one person could, there could only, you can only talk one at a time. All right. Now, in a fiber optic cable, um, you can transmit data so quickly that, um, you can time division multiplex. And so, Let's say, you know, we're going really slow, but this is one, this is four seconds long. You have one second for channel one, one second for two, one for three, one for four, and then it repeats, right? And so you can, or actually let's put this into human terms. Let's say it's 10 seconds long. So channel one can talk for 10 seconds, then channel two, then channel three, then channel four. Right. It's like, you know, taking turns, something we were all uh, taught. Right. So every 40 seconds you get to you get to speak again. Right. Without um, now in fiber optics, this is going on, but you can send so much data 
that even though you're only getting every so often, it's happening so fast that it looks seamless. But think about it, is if we didn't have modulation, right, every time we wanted to talk on the cell phone, only one cell phone could transmit at a time, all right? Even if it were going right, um, and so, yeah, cell phones, time division multiplex, they also, but but you also need a modula, um, to modulate a carrier frequency in order to do, um, to have simultaneous communication, all right? But what is modulation? Well, we take a sine wave or cosine, it's a carrier wave, and then we change it by the signal we wish to transmit. So if um, the FCC has given me the rights to broadcast at a certain um, carrier frequency, right, I can modulate that sine wave by changing the amplitude. I can modulate it by slightly changing the frequency, right? Yeah, I can't change the frequency so much that it bleeds into another radio station, right? And you can actually modulate the phase, okay? So amplitude is AM, and it's the first one because it was a lot easier to do. Um, you can practically do, you can demodulate a signal with like a pencil and a paper clip, okay? Um, which, kind of, which makes a diode, right? Um, you can change the frequency over time, that's FM, and then change the phase over time. Okay. Now, all of this can be done in a fiber optic uh, thing as well. All right. Now, another thing we need to know about um, modulation is like kind of bandwidth. So far, bandwidth has been like the width of our low pass filter. Um, or the width of a bandpass filter. Um, but in communications, bandwidth is you have a signal with, you know, certain frequencies, all right? So if I did a uh, Fourier transform of my voice and said, all right, the lowest signal he, he creates is 100 hertz and the highest one is 10 kilohertz, right? That bandwidth would be, 10 minus 100, okay? Now, yeah, the telephone goes from 0.4 to 3.4, right? Um, so the bandwidth is effectively three kilohertz. because it's the range there. Sorry to ruin your partial credit. Um, Shouldn't it be 0.4 kilohertz? Is it? I don't know. I gotta check, I gotta check. I don't know. Somebody can, I have to go look that up. But 0.4 hertz sounds, no, it can't be 0.4. Here, I'll let you email me and earn your partial credit. Okay. Oh, and by and by the way, right? Um, I've got all you know, all the haikus, all the videos. I just uh, got behind helping out the senior project students uh, to graduate, but I will be going through and updating everything and making sure um, all those emails are still there. And if you don't, um, you know, you should see all your extra credits before the, hopefully before the exam starts, okay? But there'll be messages from me, like I'm done grading, I'm done updating, now's the time to mention anything, and then the grades close. You'll, you'll get emails from me about that, okay? Anyway. 
So how do we modulate signals? Well, it's all multipliers, okay? And so one multiplier uh, from analog devices, it's about $11 a piece, and it has a 250 megahertz bandwidth, all right? Where the other day I was talking about the Anadigim multiplier, and it had like a 10 kilohertz bandwidth, all right? So... Um, now you can make a multiplier. The book has one, but nobody would really do it that way. The reason why you, those chips cost $11 is because they're worth it. Um, and so this was just, if you're trying to go from 88 to 108, 108 megahertz, you're gonna kind of need a fast multiplier, okay? So that 11, they, they know your pain point when they're selling you that chip, okay? But anyway, there's other ways to multiply. So now that we've reviewed a little bit about convolution, hopefully that's, um, you brought that out of long-term storage, right? We're multiplying to modulate. And it's the whole idea that convolution in the frequency domain is multiplication in the um, S domain. Uh, frequency domain convolution is time domain multiplication. So again, let's just do, oops, cosine 2 pi f t squared, right? And this is actually a way to, you have a multiplier, you test this multiplier, and you should really get a specific um, harmonics, one harmonic at twice the frequency. And if you're getting other any other harmonics, then um, you're having some noise issues, all right? So we just break that apart, cosine times cosine, all right? Well, what is a Fourier transform of that in the frequency domain? It's one half. And then in order for this to work, you have to have the negative frequency component and the positive, or this, the negative and positive axis of the uh, frequency domain. In the Bode plot, we only did the positive, right? But actually, Along the J omega axis, you have the negative and the positive values. All right. And for order to see what's going on, you, you need both. All right. So we transform this. So I have one half. I have a del delayed delta function. Delayed delta function. Convolved with itself. Right. But notice there's four... Um, so where you might be used to T minus delay one, T plus delay two, right? This is all going to be in frequencies, but it operates the same way, all right? So we just have to multiply everything out. So we convolve these two signals, right? Which one half times one half, that just scales to a fourth. And then I have a delay here and a delay here. And it turns out that the delays, um, right? It's minus F1, minus F2, you just get minus two F2, right? Remember that cosine squared doubles the frequency. Well, this mathematically where this is happening, all right? So that's on the, the negative frequency axis. Then we multiply this out. You get one quarter delta F plus 2T, right? And then when you do the inside term, you get one half. And the uh, frequencies here cancel out. So... If you sum all that together, right, you get the Fourier coefficients. You can even get the Fourier coefficients now directly by multiplying by two. 
all right, because we were on both sides of the axis, we had one half. So now we multiply by two and we get the expansion, all right? So we get two times a half when we take this back into the time domain, right? And so we get one plus one half cosine at twice the frequency, all right? So that's just when it's multiplied by itself, all right? And what I was saying is, is that if I was to look at this an oscilloscope, right, I should see an offset, and then I should see a cosine at twice the frequency. Now, if I was doing the FFT, right, that would be my A naught, which Scopey and LT Spice don't show you the DC, but I should have one harmonic at twice the frequency. Okay. And if I don't, well, that's an issue. So just to see what's going on is I now I have a cosine here, right? And um, so the cosine gives me something at a negative frequency, something at a positive frequency. So two, these are delta functions, right? And this, right, it's both sides of what looks like a 50% duty cycle square wave, right? Because notice I have F1, 3, that should be 5, all right? But the shape looks like a pulse width. So now what I'm going to do is convolve this. So these two close frequencies, right, as they're coming along, I'll get something. All right, and then I'll get something. So since there's two frequencies here, right, the negative and the positive, when I go around here, I'll get something added and something delayed. So I'll get a kind of a doubling of frequency at every spot. And so without that negative, you wouldn't really see that. Like out here in the positive, you'd see two spike, you'd see two delta functions and have no idea where it came from. All right. So if you go through this, these frequencies, are now, you've, you've convolved it, right? You've modulated it, all right? So let's uh, do some Python plotting. So I have my, you know, what is my cosine, right? It's one half a delta function plus the frequency minus the frequency, right? Because the minus puts it greater than zero, the plus puts it uh, less than zero, right? So now I want to multiply a signal which will be convolving in the um, time domain, right? Which in this case was twenty. And you can see that I have this signal here and it's splitting it apart. Okay. Now, um, I like this plot a little bit better is here's my data, right? And I'm at a lower frequency, I think 10. And then I'm convolving that with a higher frequency, right, at 1,000. So you know, I, the, I'll convolve these two delta functions here, so I'll get something plus or minus 10 off of the thou minus 1,000, plus or minus 10 off of the 1,000. And this is what it would look like. Now, it still looks like that's a solid line, but what it is is 
plus or minus 10 out of 1,000 is really hard to see. So it's still very close to 1,000, all right? What does that look like in the time domain? Well, you can see that there's a fast acting sine wave, right? With the peaks this far apart, and then a slow whoop, acting sine wave, all right? And this is called double sideband modulation, all right? And you can just, here's my original signal. It's my original data, right? Then here is my carrier signal. I, I just multiply it together. But then to demodulate it, actually, you multiply it together again, and then with re you recover it with a filter. Okay. So to demodulate that multiply, you actually, that, that carry um, modulation, you actually multiply it again by the same thing, right? Um, and what happens is you get your 10 hertz signal back and then the carrier frequency is moved off. All right, so you, so you still, it's that high frequency is still there, but you can see the shape <clears throat> excuse me, of the original signal, right? So now we need to convert this, right? And you just do that with a filter, right? <clears throat> now, AM modulation, um, It's really beyond the scope of this class, okay? Um, I, I mean, I, I put the notes together before I realized that there's this is just too much, all right? But. Um, the bottom line is, is you're multiplying something and that changes the frequency, right? And yeah, you get this shape like this. And what's great is that you can use a diode to kind of rectify that, right? Or a full wave rectifier. You can use a half wave rectifier or a full wave rectifier would be even better, right? And so a half wave rectifier really can just be a pencil on a piece of metal that that's like a really junky diode that's why it was used you can see that even in this example there's still some ripple there but you can filter it even more or even your ears would filter it out right to some extent okay but really um is that, right, when you, um, oops, When you multiply things together, right, it changes the frequency of the spectrum. All right, so if I have, If I convolve these two signals, right, I 
I have these two signals, okay, on both sides, right? And that's how you can take voice data and then convert it to, you know, television carrier wave or FM wave or your, um, you know, your cell phone, right? It's really multiplying it. And then recovering as you remultiply it back by the original, and then you actually get the, the data back in the middle. Now, why am I just talking about a sine wave, right? Is because every signal can be broken up into a series of sines and cosines, right? And that omega naught would be, you know, whatever the time frame was for your sampling, that would become your omega naught. But everything is just, I'm just showing one, right? Omega two, sure, that's the carrier frequency. That's, but here, the shape in the book when they kind of show this is that, you have some data, but it's all made up of sines and cosines inside, right? So really, once you know one, well, then you can do it for, for everything, all right? Um, but, you know, for the homework, right, you have data, right, that then you multiply by some carrier frequency, right? You have to receive it. So here's my attempt at an antenna, right? And it's not enough. What wasn't shown so far is that then because the radios have different carrier frequencies, yeah, you got to use a bandpass filter to get back that symbol, which then you multiply a version of the original carrier signal, right? So that's, this arrow is the data. Right. And then you filter it. And then you can hear it. Right. Now. The question, the other question, it is, it's like a thought provoking question. Right. But we have pulse width modulation. Right. And that's like the duty cycle, right? And so when I say modulate it, can this be used for modulation, right? You can, based on the amplitude, you can be changing what that duty cycle is, all right? But, um, So if you look through, you can answer that question. All right, I don't want to give it away though, but um, that's, that's what that means. So any questions so far, okay?
Well, um, to answer your second part, why do you need a carrier frequency, right? Let's say um, you know I'm just emitting. I'm speaking, right? Oops. And the pressure waves, right, have a frequency of one kilohertz. And then I just turn that into an, an E and M wave that has a kilohertz, right? Um, so as I speak, the um, frequency of whatever I'm saying is, is changing. And I can convert that directly into some kind of carrier frequency, but if I mean, into just elect, I can just broadcast it, right? I can have a transducer that's broadcasting at the same frequencies that I'm speaking. Well, everyone would be talking at the same time, and all the E and M waves would be interfering with each other. Just like here, before we convert it into an E and M wave, if everybody in the room is talking, we're effectively using the same channel, right? So, what we do is, you know, the radio stations, right? You have 88.5, like 94.5. Oh, what's another one, right? So these can all go simultaneously, right? So let's call that the, you know, this is the frequency domain. These are all happening at the same time, okay? And if I want to capture just one of them, well, then I just do a band pass around it. All right, now I just have that frequency. Now, remember, in FM modulation, this is moving back and forth slightly in FM, right? In AM, the amplitude is changing with time, right? But um, but if these are separated enough, right, they don't bleed into each other. And yeah, if the encoding, I'm talking about amplitude and frequency modulation and continuous time. If you're doing digital signal, pro, if you're sending digital signals, these two channels can be closer or you can get um, more um, more data. Now, the other thing, too, is um, the wavelength of your EM signal uh, determines can it penetrate a building or not? Can it go around a building? Does it bounce off the ionosphere? So there's all these... Um, FM reception tends to be better because it's um, you don't it's not as hard to lose the signal because all you have to do is detect a frequency changing, but if the amplitude um, gets too low, you can't pick up the signal at all for amplitude. But this is all this idea of doing it in parallel, right? And the thing is, is on a fiber optic cable, right? Yeah, uh, everything's at, let's say, one wavelength was 1.55 uh, microns. However, I can have a channel at 1.45, 1.6 microns, almost as if it's, um, so I can just have slightly different um, modulation frequencies like a radio down the fiber optic cable. And here's the thing, if I have a cable right, and it's under the ocean, right, and I don't want to lay another one, but if I can make better modulators, right, let's say I can squeeze more channels in here, well, I can increase my throughput without laying new cable. No, did, uh, everything's digital now. 
Okay. Just so you know, um, it's just this is a continuous time class. Um, so I talk about it in terms like that. But, um, you know, if you go to Guitar Center and buy an analog record and put it on an analog player and you listen to it with your analog ears, it's analog. Practically everything else is, is digital. Okay. Somewhere. And here's the thing. Even if you had an old school analog phone and hooked it up to your uh, landline, right? It gets digitized somewhere along the line. Okay. Yeah, Michael, that's right. The carrier frequency would be the same as the station frequency, sure. <laughs> now, um, I know there's folks that, you know, say they can tell the difference, and maybe they can, but um, just so you know that expectation, sometimes expectations really can drive what you experience. And so there's studies that show if I show you a bottle of one bottle of wine is $100 and the other one is five, you will rate on average, right? If you interview 100 people, more people will rate the $100 bottle better than the $5 bottle, even if ultimately it's the same wine in there. Right. I know I have a guitar player at home. <laughs> We've had this. Uh, so, yeah, you're right, Nick. I, I So the thing is, is um, you, you know, if your sampling frequency is high enough, you should be able to do just about anything, right? But um, I think, like, in that project we were talking about, about distortion, um, it might be really hard to create some effects um, digitally. Right. There could be some nonlinearities, but the original feedback was just putting a speaker and a microphone, you know, in proximity to each other. And the feedback coefficient was just how close you were. <laughs> now, yeah, some people have higher frequency, right? There's um, right, a guilty pleasure. I was watching the show Evil and these girls were like singing a song and I think killing themselves or something because there was an encoded message at a frequency that only people who were younger than teenage years could hear. Okay. So yeah, Donald, if you can hear 48 kilohertz, right? Yeah, that that's true. Some people can hear higher. Um, I don't think I'm up at 48 anymore. Right. CDs digitize at 44. Okay. So um, they did a study about Stradivarius violins where they had the violin player blind and the audience blind, and they couldn't really tell the difference between a Stradivarius or not. <laughs> That's okay, Don. You could be sarcastic. Um, or was that the joke? Because, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the thing is, is like with response times, right? Uh, some people have a faster response time than others. It, it is true. Okay. But yeah, 44 kilohertz. You, you probably got me a good one. <laughs> yeah, snake oil. There's these, what I call house heaters. They're these class A amplifiers that you can get at um, Best Buy. And class A amplifiers waste a lot of energy as heat. And so if you, they're green, I forget their name. But if you go over there, um, you can see the tubes, which I don't know if they're really using or it's just like some kind of display but you can kind of warm yourself up with these amplifiers. Yeah, 
that's it. Um, McIntosh, right, that's it. <laughs> Right, the average person would he um, hears up to about 20, which is why they digitize at 44, which is slightly better than the Nyquist, all right? Um, but that's for digitizing, right? Now, yeah, our phones, you don't, right, they're not digitizing at 44 kilohertz, so they're cutting out high frequency things. Um, you're right, Bradley, age plays a huge factor. And uh, I have a filter of only hearing what I want to hear. At least that's what my kids say. Um, Nick, class D, class A, B, C, D. Um, actually, it doesn't matter the kind of electronics. It's just probably class D, nobody ever made a, a tube-based one. Yeah, meaning class A amplifiers were invented when there was only tubes and then B, C and, and that. But then um, I think class D is pulse width modulation, right? Which by the time they came up with that scheme, it was probably more solid state, okay? Or it could be if tubes don't have the frequency response, right? But yeah, there would have been a time in your Maddie 153 class where probably you were talking about tubes, then it went to BJTs. Um, now it's still the materials. It, it'll be more your 128. All right. Um, we can go into breakout rooms to do uh, activity module 28. Um, we still got about 15 minutes. That would be another, um, maybe a better activity than just <laughs> talking about the audio. Although I know you're all into it, okay? So um, you should now be able to share your screen when you go into the breakout rooms, all right? I hope. Okay. At least it was sharing was working with um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so people no, I mean, right, Alex, you probably couldn't share last time, but I think this time you should be able to, because now it, I, I enabled it. All right, so we have... Okay. Okay, the rooms are all open, you can go. Uh, Professor? Yes, sir. So remember, uh, I was the one that emailed you about the module, what, 28, was it? And you told me to put the the multiply between the AV and the point zero one two three. You remember? Um, it was from Monday. 
You mind if I share my screen? Because I think it'll just be easy. Yeah, yeah, actually. sure. All right. So remember this? You told me to put the, the multiply here. Yeah. Yeah. So it still didn't work. So I'm just wondering if. It but works. I went and looked, and it you have full credit somewhere else. Yeah, it's on the the 27 one, module 27 instead of 28. Hold on. Okay. Let me see. All right. I'm not talking because I can't do two things at once. Yeah, no problem. But that, that's um, Yeah, it says 10 points. On 28 or 27? 28. Oh. Are you, are you oh, looking uh, at Esteban or Sebastian? Oh, wait. <laughs> Sebastian. Yeah, I'm a, uh -oh. I'm a Esteban. Yeah. Well, that explains that. <laughs> so, um, I'm having a hard time. You know, I don't know. No, I, I don't worry. I was just wondering, like, if this. No, like, no, it is correct. something funny. Like, the only thing I can think of is. So I just marked you full credit. Oh, the only thing I can think. The only thing I can think of is that it didn't like the rounding. Okay. Um, but I have it I set so that you can you should be able to round. Oh, there but you go. Everyone, <laughs> But every once in a while, something happens. So, I, I mean, I just I just rounded it. I just didn't know I didn't round it, and I got the the credit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. I mean, I've given you full credit too, but oh, okay. 
but I really, um, it's a, it's a numerical thing. And what yeah. it could be is I have to, um, look at the question Yeah, the relative tolerance is fine. Probably I have what? All right, there's something I probably have to do. I don't worry about it. Yeah, I was gonna say you could just leave it like that because there's only like one zero two percent of the grades. So really no, no, but it, no, no, it's a pain, and you start doubting yourself. And oh, okay. Um. Now, I just came back to just wonder if, it, if it's right or not. It was right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Well, uh, quick question, too. So for the final, it's going to be open book as well? Everything's the same. Okay. Nice. And so for the final, whatever grading on the final is going to stay as the final grade. So, like, the midterm one and two won't affect the final. But the final will affect the interim one too. I mean, um, uh, it's all in the green sheet, the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah. Um, the final is the final. All three parts stay the final, whatever it is. Yeah, I got you. But if you demonstrate mastery on midterm one and midterm two on the final, well, then I'll raise your grade. Yeah. yeah. Meaning I'll assume those were bad days, right? And that you learned it at the end of the semester. Now, the reason why, but the thing is, is it is cumulative. What can you do all at the same time having to know everything? That's why midterms don't replace finals. Right. Yeah. I have people, you know, they're <laughs> um, every once in a while, people will like, well, wait, you said, and I'm like, no, I never said. Okay. Yep. Anything else? Okay. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Howdy. Garija, what's up? Uh, I am done. That's why I left the room. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you can ask whatever questions you want to ask, or you can just go. Uh, Although I think um, I'll stop recording.